take a look at this vacant lot, or this one, or even this. And how about this parking lot? Empty pretty much all the time. These are the kind of places you probably pass by without giving them a second thought. But it turns out that every vacant lot or underused parking lot has hidden value waiting to be unlocked. In fact, vacant lots in urban areas could be the answer to some of our city's biggest problems. Building new housing in existing urban areas can reduce traffic and commute times, lower housing costs, provide much needed housing to help end the housing affordability crisis, and reduce urban carbon emissions. Many of these advantages are because the alternative is much worse. Building housing and shops on the urban fringe in the suburbs makes it harder for people to afford to live near where they work, accelerates the loss of valuable farmland, and destroys natural habitat. But can vacant lots really do much good? I mean, there's so much land available on the edge of cities and there aren't that many vacant lots. But you'd be surprised by what an impact those vacant lots can make. One research group from UCLA figured out that Los Angeles could add more than 1 million new homes in vacant or underused land. Even more impressive, they would only need 1% of the city's total land area. Even more impressive still, it wouldn't take massive skyscrapers, but something closer to five or six story buildings. Even more impressive, Los Angeles could do this along only one corridor, Wilshire Boulevard, right here. One million more residents without touching 99% of LA's land area, all while preventing even more sprawl Southern California is known for. That's amazing. That was a hypothetical project, but there are plenty of practical ways that exist right now to encourage development within a city as opposed to on the urban fringe. It's what planners call infill development. Check out this parking lot near a BART station in Millbrae, near San Francisco. Not a great use of space, and much of it is empty. It's also next to a parking garage. Now it has a six-story office building, hotel, retail, and 320 homes, 80 of those affordable to low-income families. This infill is also transit-oriented development, which means even less traffic and emissions than just infill alone. If those 320 homes were single-family houses, they would have consumed approximately 80 acres of farmland, far from any transit. Let's learn about all the ways infill development can make cities more sustainable and equitable, and how you can make it happen in your community, after the bike bell. Okay, let's just jump right into it. How can cities encourage infill development? Cities can rezone or upzone land. Rezoning means changing a zone from, say, residential to mixed use. Rezoning for mixed use gives developers more flexibility and can encourage new projects. Upzoning means keeping the same basic use, say residential, but allowing more of it than before. An R1 residential zone may allow for four dwelling units per acre, while an R2 may allow for 12 or more. Cities across my state are rezoning strip malls, auto dealerships, unused industrial areas, and more to include allowed uses like housing and retail. In San Jose, a city known for its swaths of single-family home zoning, the city started a program to create little walkable downtowns by rezoning strip malls and low-density commercial areas. They call it their Urban Villages program. One of my favorite examples from this program is the Stevens Creek Boulevard Urban Villages plan. You can see the site as it is today, strip commercial uses lining a pretty busy arterial street. This really could be in any suburb in the US. And here's what the city envisions for this area. Higher density housing and retail, green space instead of endless parking lots, and places for the community to gather. It's designed to complement the nearby low density housing, while still adding density to a community that really needs it. To get to this vision, the city is rezoning the land to allow for higher densities, and creating a new land use designation called Urban Village, which mandates developers build mixed use in the form of neighborhoods serving business on the ground floor with housing above, and prohibiting pedestrian unfriendly uses like self-storage and big box stores. Finally, the plan calls for the city to provide incentives to include affordable units. Infill can also happen in suburban residential locations. Recent laws here in California allow homeowners to split their lot in half and add an extra home. And they can also add accessory dwelling units, basically tiny homes as well. ADUs have the ability to bring lots of new units onto the market without noticeably changing the face of the city or the character of the neighborhood. These policy changes at the state and local level aren't meant to be a big deal. They're just giving more freedom to developers and property owners to maximize the value of their properties. And there are a lot of properties that could benefit, particularly those with big old parking lots. Maybe you've seen maps like this. They highlight all the parking lots and garages in downtown areas. Map after map shows the same thing. Parking may be the single most common land use in many US cities. There's simply too much parking just about everywhere. Zoning codes in nearly all U.S. cities specify the amount of parking for every possible land use. One parking space for every 60 square feet of dining space in a restaurant, or one space for every 50 square feet of a funeral home. They sort of sound reasonable, but studies done to determine these numbers are often out of date, or they're based on one study in one place in the U.S. It may not reflect reality anywhere else. 
These figures, called parking minimums, have a major impact on the amount of spaces in a city. They have produced anywhere between three and eight parking spaces per car, depending on the estimate. According to that same research group from UCLA, about 14% of Los Angeles County's incorporated land is dedicated to parking. That's roughly 200 square miles. I have a whole video on how parking lots are oversized that you can go check out if you're interested. Some US cities have eliminated those parking minimums are even leading by example and have begun to propose and develop new housing on public parking lots. A great example of this type of project is a city-owned, barely-used parking lot in downtown Santa Barbara, which is being converted into an apartment building with some affordable units. And in San Francisco, the city is proposing new affordable housing on a large parking lot for a DMV location right at the tip of the panhandle. These are the kind of projects that advocates hope for when parking minimums are eliminated. In both cases, underused parking lots are being transformed into affordable housing, housing that's broadly affordable to teachers, nurses, and other essential workers that cities need. Those workers don't need to travel from far distances, which is time consuming and expensive. In general, studies show that the greater the urban density of a city, the lower its transportation energy use per capita. And that's important because transportation makes up a large percentage of US greenhouse gas emissions, up to 38%, according to the Congressional Budget Office. Residents of infill development would be far less likely to have long commutes and more likely to use public transportation, walk, or bike, decreasing the carbon output of our cities. A neighborhood that was once unwalkable can even be transformed if the empty spaces in it are filled in, promoting a more pedestrian-friendly environment. This can reduce the need for car trips, particularly for short trips. Infill development can also come in the form of transit-oriented development, which is a development strategy that focuses on building homes and businesses near transit stations. Transit-oriented development can help reduce car dependency by providing people with access to convenient and reliable public transportation options. And space near transit isn't always hard to find. The channel City Nerd made a great video on terrible land uses next to transit stops and found many examples of surface level parking lots right next to rapid rail lines like this one in Sacramento. Park and ride might have some logic behind it, but it's increasingly indefensible when we have a housing crisis. Land like this is just waiting to be reused. This can be particularly important for low income households who may not be able to afford a car at all. Finally, infill development can reduce the need to build brand new infrastructure like utilities and sewer to serve a new neighborhood. According to a study by the Sightline Institute, adding one mile of new highway lane will increase CO2 emissions by more than 100,000 tons over 50 years because of the new materials and energy required for brand new development. If we build upwards rather than out, we can use existing roads, sewer mains, and power lines, helping us stave off using any more energy than we need to. Infill isn't just good for the environment, it's good for people as well. There isn't enough housing where people work, so middle and lower income people are being pushed further and further from job centers forcing them to take longer and longer commutes. Those commutes cost money, both for the car and gas, and can adversely affect people's health and well-being. And you know what else costs money? Oversized homes on oversized lots. Household sizes are shrinking, and smaller homes in urban areas can be a better fit. They can also be more affordable, particularly if built in large numbers. Residents don't have to pay for the upkeep of those homes and yards either. Without all of those big yards, it'll be much easier to conserve valuable farmland and open space. Here in California, the state Sustainable Agricultural Lands Conservation Program uses cap and trade funds to halt urban sprawl. The state government provides grants to protect productive land through conservation easements, protecting it from development. It also provides planning grants to cities and counties to update their land use policies to preserve open space. So far, 142,000 acres have been made agricultural only through 116 property acquisition projects. The great thing about infill development is that it only takes a few good policies working in concert to create an environment conducive to new construction. In housing starved areas of the country like California, the policies are there and the state is starting to see results. Each one reduces barriers that will help end the housing crisis and result in more sustainable and equitable cities for everyone. We may not see 1 million new residents on Wilshire Boulevard, but incremental change everywhere can still get us there. Next time you walk around your city, try to spot the vacant lots or underused parking lots that would be perfect for infill development. And now you know the policies that would get them redeveloped into something better.